Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. Today I want to talk quickly about artificial general intelligence, efficiency, the ability to learn on the fly, Tesla, Moravec's paradox, and of course the stars of the show Francois Cholet and Marcus Patel, who had a very interesting conversation a couple of days ago. The entire conversation is about 22-23 minutes. I will leave a link to that in the description. I highly recommend listening to the whole thing. I'm just taking out a couple of pieces of it today so I can discuss their thoughts on artificial general intelligence and specifically the two ideas of the ability to learn on the fly, and I will add in how that affects Tesla, their full self-driving, their Optimus robots, and other humanoid robots, etc. And then also the lack of efficacy of putting in exponentially more compute, whether it's human or artificial intelligence, towards problems, how you see less and less result, even though you put in exponentially more input. So we'll start here with a clip where Dwarkes mostly is expounding on the ability to learn on the fly. Their ability to learn on the job. So not the ability to adapt to a new task they've seen, but just the way a human, you know, a human employee will not be useful for the first three, six months they're working for you. They're building up all this context, they're learning from their failures, they're picking up small improvements and efficiencies so, as they work for you. And I just, I, it doesn't seem like there's an easy way to slot in this key capability into these models. Actually, because how do you define the difference between the ability to adapt to a new task and learning on the fly? It's, it sounds like the same thing to me. Well, if I'm calling back on something I learned three months ago on my job, um, and look, for me, it would be something like, oh, YouTube Analytics has taught me some interesting pattern, and I've like, I have now a theory about how that interacts with how I'm producing episodes now. Th calling forth that previous knowledge and having a sort of like rich understanding of it it doesn't seem like adapt, you know, adapting to the new problem. Yeah, yeah. So it's simultaneously learning uh, on the fly, learning on the job, and being able to store and recall that knowledge after the fact. And not just a drive recall. So obviously, if you just do supervised fine tuning on something, you will like remember the facts themselves. But some sort of more adaptive. I, I guess we just don't even know what humans are doing, so it's hard to put into words exactly what the analogous ML procedure is. So it's worth breaking in here. This is an interesting um, definitional difference between these two. What Dwarkush is calling dry recall would be something like retrieval augmented generation, RAG, or just fine tuning uh, the model on a specific set of data. That gives you the ability to recall facts. That would be what I guess he would be calling dry recall. But the more interesting recall, at least as he's putting it, and I think this is true too, is adaptive recall. So it's like, well, I've seen something similar to this before, and I think what I can do is I can take this experience I've had on the job, and I can move that experience, or I can synthesize some experience from here, some experience from here, and I can put it together into a new form that works substantially better than either of the input values, either of the input spaces. That synthesis of information is very important to the way humans work at an, an expert level, right? So again, as he says, the first you know couple of months on a new job, you're kind of okay at it. You're not great, but you're mostly learning about the company culture. You're learning about how you fit into it. You're learning about the new patterns of working and things and what's expected of you. And over time, you get better and better. And to tie this back into Tesla and also humanoid robots and everything, this is one of the areas where they really, really fail. They are, as I've said many, many times in many videos, Tesla full self-driving is a really good generic driver. It's really good as in if you put me in a new city I'd never been in before in the United States for example, so like Oklahoma City or something, right? I, I, I think I passed through there one time, but I've never driven in that city. If you just plop me down in the middle of there with a car and you had me drive, I would be a good generic driver. But over a period of time, I will become a better and better local driver to Oklahoma City. And, you know, Athens, after living here for basically 20 years, I'm a very good local driver and even know the fact that when the school year starts, the quality of driving goes way down, like right now, because the students come in there 18, 19 years old, don't know how to drive, don't know the city. So I know that I have to back off my driving and be a little more defensive at this point because the driving quality goes down so much here. That's local knowledge that's not generic knowledge to just driving itself. That's local to this city and that helps me to be a better driver in Athens. The problem with full self-driving is that you get a good generic driver but you don't get a good local driver at least right now. Now there are ways of 
improving that situation, but it's kind of along the lines of what Dwarkesh is talking about here, which is an adaptive sort of recall where you're able to recall facts about the locality you're in and then also adapt your behavior based on that and synthesizing information from multiple sources. Like I'm not just synthesizing information at the start of the school year about driving on a particular road on a particular day, but I'm also taking account of something that has nothing to do with driving, at least directly, which is that 55,000 people just suddenly arrived in town and they're not particularly good drivers. And so I need to take that externality into account as I'm driving the first couple weeks of the school year. So, I mean, a good example here is uh, in context learning. I think it, this genuinely has the human like ability to not only the written words in the context, but it's like it's picked up your style and it's picked up like it has a very rich understanding of what you want. And you want this to persist for three months, six months. This is like what humans do when they're on a job. And you think the memory features that are starting to crop up in uh, most commercial LMs, they are not up to your expectations? That's not what you meant? Yeah, I think they work really well for coding because there's this external scaffold, which is the code base itself, which is based in language, which it can call on. But most work doesn't have this sort of um, uh, this external uh, me me existing memory like the code base is. And furthermore, even for coding, once you do like, um, I mean, this was the meter paper that came out. Like one of the theories of why this kind of thing happens is this context rot, and especially when you have to compact the uh, Lisa Claude code, if you ask it like, okay, I've, it's, we've been talking for an hour, now I need to compact this again. Um, it just sort of like, it just forgets about the hard, hard one innovations you guys came up with together. And so that gets us to a really interesting point that gets us to the point of efficiency and intelligence. And I'm going to riff on what they're talking about here, obviously, but there is a way in which intelligence is efficiency. So the human brain is not big enough to store all of the data about the universe that we encounter through our lifetimes. So part of our intelligence, part of you know what goes on up here is compactifying all of that information into the things that are essential to us having a good quality life. Now, back in the old days, that was like not getting eaten by a lion or something like that and finding food and finding a mate, those kinds of things. Obviously, that has extended out a little bit in modern life to other things as well. But our ability to be efficient with the knowledge that we store and efficient with the recall of that knowledge is critically important. And the problem with large language models, and also I will say with things like full self-driving and robotics in general, is that there's a sort of forgetfulness about things that have happened. There's an inability to compact information into an efficient format to remember that for future reference. So basically the way that artificial intelligence is working right now is a bit brute force, right? You take a gigantic neural network, potentially trillions of parameters, you throw a bunch of training data at it, and then you go like, oh cool, it's calling things, but then it's unable to compact that knowledge and specifically it's unable to compact new knowledge and remember that in an efficient way that's not just generically good, but good for a specific task. And that's a real trick because the way these things generally work is, of course, you take data in, you train them, and then you put out a model and that model is more or less frozen. That is not like a human being at all. We humans are constantly growing, adapting, and changing throughout our lives. You don't just get a, a John 1.5 or something like that that was like June 13th of 2017, right? That's, that's who I am. And then I'm just frozen there for a year or something. That's not the way we work. We're constantly adapting and changing. And the lack of ability of these models to efficiently pull in new information, localized information, or even generic information that's globally important, and modify their neurons, the weights of their neurons, interactively as things are going on, so that they get better at their tasks, that is a big problem. And it's a big problem for driving. Again, just like I said, you need to have that local knowledge of a given area in order to be the best driver. You can't just be a generically good driver in order to be a really high quality driver in a specific city and a specific country. You have to have local knowledge and therefore you have to be able to efficiently take in that information, learn from it, adapt yourself to those conditions. And what that effectively means is millions of localized AIs, not one one big giant generic AI. So that's a really interesting challenge and problem, both from a compute side of things, like where do we get the compute to run all of these localized models, but also from an architectural point of view, how do you create architectures that allow this to happen in an efficient manner? 
And generally speaking, both Francois and Dworkes think that artificial general intelligence is a ways off at this point. And I have to say that I'm coming around to that. I thought for a while we were on such an exponential curve that we were learning really, really fast and we might get to AGI. But I have always said we need one more major architectural breakthrough. And I am more and more convinced of that. I think that we are further away from artificial general intelligence than many of us thought maybe a year or two ago, because it looks like this exponential curve is flattening. We're entering kind of a flatter, more S-curve area of this exponential growth. Now, if we get another architectural breakthrough, or if I'm wrong in general, we might see something that takes off again immediately, and then it could happen, you know, in six months or a year or something. But I think, you know, 2028 to 2030 is a much more reasonable estimation of when we're going to get to this sort of AGI moment. Okay, skipping forward a little bit, we're going to continue on here. Usually when you see um, an exponential increase like this, it's an increase in, in uh, either an input or an output of the system. It's not really uh, an increase in the things you care about. For instance, if you look at uh, economic growth, um, is, um, is our lifestyle improving exponentially? I'm not sure. Like if you look over the past like 50 years, I'm not sure that that's been true. Um, even though, well, the economy was obviously you know, improving at uh, several percent a year. Um, and uh, you, could, you could look at science as well. Um, I don't think so today. If you look at um, science as a system and you look at its inputs, like the, the, the number of researchers that are, that are, that are uh, uh, active or the amount of compute that we are dedicated to, de dedicating to science and so on, uh, we are putting into the system dramatically more resources than like 50 years prior or 100 years prior. But if you look at the output, if you look at the magnitude uh, of scientific discoveries and the pace of scientific progress, I'm not convinced that science is moving faster today than it was 100 years ago. And even though we had, we had like 100 years ago, we had much, much fewer people uh, 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 working like physics, for instance, or chemistry, uh, but the, 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 the impact of their discoveries was much greater. And part of that is just because, you know, they, they, they could work on uh, low-hanging fruits, like they, they, they had more, uh, more freedom to work on the important problems that were not already solved, you know. Uh, and, um, the, the, the more time passes, the harder it is to, to, to make that, that same magnitude of impact. Like in some fields, the very first paper to found the field uh, at more impact than every subsequent paper, for instance. So when Francois talks about more inputs, what he's literally talking about is more human beings. In other words, we've got population growth, we've got more scientists, we've got more chemists, we've got more physicists, etc. Over the past 100, 120 years or so, we've got more and more and more of these scientists, but they're making collectively less and less impact. Now, you can argue from an engineering point of view that things have been pretty amazing. We've invented the transistor, we've invented computers, we've gone to the moon, we've created incredible software architectures, neural networks, etc. But on a fundamental physics point of view, we're really still looking at stuff that was discovered in the teens and 20s, the 19 teens and 1920s, general relativity and quantum mechanics. Those two things are the foundational discoveries. And what he's saying is, even though we've thrown exponentially more humans at the problem, we haven't really made any fundamental advances like that in the past 100 plus years. Now, part of the argument might be that literally there's nothing left to discover. That's an interesting problem because, of course, in the 1870s, 1880s, I believe, Lord Kelvin famously said that physics was basically done. Don't go into physics because there's not a lot to discover. And then, of course, there were major discoveries. Everything was turned over on its head in the early 20th century. But there is a feeling there's less and less to discover. But the other end of this is that you can put in exponentially more compute. In this case, it's human beings, but we can also consider that you know, artificial compute, silicon compute, and that exponentially more input does not necessarily give you exponentially more output. So your input can go like this and your output might stay flat and linear or even tail off. And that becomes an interesting economic question, especially when you're talking about artificial intelligence. It's like, so you're throwing in 10 times more money than you did last year or two years ago to do less actual work than what happened a couple of years ago with one tenth of the cost and material input, etc. Is it worthwhile? Where is the economic benefit of this? Or will we again get to the top of the S-curve and then break through that again? I think that we can, but I think it's going to require a fundamental advancement like attention mechanisms in transformers. And so I'll finish up with the video here with one more short clip about efficiency. We've been substantially limited in human civilization by the fact that over the last 
you know, 50 years ago, um, 100 years ago, there was this demographic change where the human population actually stopped increasing so that you, do, you wouldn't just get this increase in growth from inputs. Whereas the AI uh, population can keep growing exponentially because the inputs um, can produce more outputs, it, which it is can, more, but more that, data that centers. Might not, that might not actually matter. Like, for instance, I don't think science right now is uh, bottlenecked by intelligence itself. So having infinite intelligence is not, is not going to yield like, uh, infinite results, yeah. in, okay. in, my, in my opinion. So of course, this is just Francois's opinion, but I share it. I think that what we're seeing is this exponential growth in input, whether, again, that's human input or artificial input, and we're not seeing exponential results from it. We're seeing a flattening of the results. So there might just be some universal limit to how much intelligence can actually affect the world or discover things about the world. We don't know at this point because, of course, humans have just been on the planet and basically what we've done is we've bootstrapped ourselves by going from hundreds of thousands of humans on the planet, you know, a million years ago to eight plus billion humans on the planet right now. That is a massive, massive growth. And basically the, the, the Gaia mind, the mind of the globe has gotten more intelligent because we've just thrown more humans at it. But at some point, it doesn't really matter. That intelligence seems to not be making a difference. There's a bit of a Moravix paradox kind of analog here, which is that some of the things that we've thought would be the most difficult have turned out to be relatively easier because we humans have thought about some things as the pinnacle of intelligence. Well, Moravik's paradox is basically that you could have something that can crush you at chess, which pretty much any decent AI can do at this point. It can crush a human at chess, but at the same time, it can't get up and walk around like a two-year-old can. Even today, it's basically unable to do that without looking like it did something in its diapers or something, right? Now, that's changing over time, but that, that basic functionality of humans, a two year old can do is something that it's taken robots until very, very recently to do. And so we're seeing the same thing in kind of in a more general sense in terms of intelligence. There's stuff like coding in particular and writing in general, which these models do exceptionally well. And so it makes them look really, really intelligent. But then you ask them basic questions that any like five-year-old would understand how to solve. And this is one of the ARC challenges, right? That's why Francois Cholet created the ARC 1 and now ARC 2 challenge was to show that humans have this ability ability to learn new information on the fly, to synthesize that information, to efficiently understand that information, and to output the right answer, whereas these large language models are still to this day unable to do that. And it's very paradoxical, and it really, as they're arguing here, comes down to efficiency of learning. How much compute and how much memory do you have to put into these things? How much input do you have to put in to create another incremental gain in the effective intelligence that you get on the output side? And that, it turns out, is, is exponential and potentially super exponential, which is why I have thought for many years that we need another architectural breakthrough. We can't just do it through brute force. It looks like the bitter lesson actually does have an end at some point. And what we're going to need is more intelligence input into this. Probably human intelligence, but maybe AI will be able to figure it out on its own what that architectural breakthrough is. But I very firmly believe we need at least one more architectural breakthrough before we get to artificial generation general intelligence because we need that efficiency. We need to overcome more of its paradox through efficiency and intelligence, and that will improve large language models and abstract intelligence, but it will also improve Tesla's full self-driving, the humanoid robotic space, etc. Alrighty, folks, those are my thoughts about efficiency, AGI, intelligence, more of its paradox, full self-driving, autonomy, humanoid robots, and so on and so forth. Let me know in the comments what you think about all of this. While you're down there, if you don't mind liking the video, it helps out with YouTube's AI, and please consider subscribing for more of this kind of content, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.